um, be going over exponents, logarithms, and radicals. And um, I'm Ephraim Chun, and you'll learn more about me in the coming slides. All right. Um, but first, uh, we'll be getting a word from uh, the president. Sorry for the cringy title. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to say like only a few words. It shouldn't take long. Uh, I'm very excited because this is our first ever live lecture. This is our debut. And uh, we're grateful for everyone who you know signed up and attended the lecture. Uh, you know, we're really excited to see what happens today and also what happens down the road. We hope uh, this lecture is helpful and enjoyable. And if you have any feedback, you can just let us know and like through email or through Discord. Yeah, and that's all I had. You can go ahead with it. All right, thank you very much. So, an overview about the coming weeks. Um, as noted previously, this is the first ever live lecture of ALP. And in the following weeks, we will be covering sequences and series on July 21st, polynomials um, and conics. And my TA assistants are Ishan and uh, Vikram. However, due to conflict, um, the TAs will be uh, Vikram and I think maybe Vivian as well. And th this class will go from 4 o'clock to 5.30 p.m. Um, Eastern time. All right, so my name is Afram Chun. I'm a junior at Lexington High School. And um, I've participated in many uh, different types of uh, math competitions, as you can see right here, and I enjoy playing uh, chess as a hobby. Um, uh, one of my TAs is um, uh, Vikram, or sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, um, who is a rising eighth grader in Connecticut, and he has also Wait, was that was I lagging? I'll, I'll say that again. My other TA is Vikram who is a rising uh, eighth grader in Connecticut. And um, he has also participated in many math contests and has uh, received very good scores on them. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to be here, and I hope you are too. Yeah. Uh, our other TA today is Vivian Lowe who is a rising sophomore from Pennsylvania. And you can also see that she is a USA JAMA qualifier and four-time Amy qualifier, and also has participated in a variety of math competitions in the past. Her favorite uh, math subject is geometry and outside of mathematics, um, she enjoys chatting with friends. All right, so let's get into uh, today's topic. And we start with the basics of exponents. So. Um, exponents are just a much more easier way of writing a bunch of numbers that are multiplied, which are usually the same number. So in this scenario, um, we have a of n, which is just a times a times a times a n times. And some vocab that you should know is that a is known as the base, and then b is, or in this case, n is known as the exponent. Um, all right, so there are some rules to these exponents that are extremely useful, especially when you're solving math problems or um, uh, rules that you can manipulate to solve different types of problems. So our, our, our first rule is when a is not equal to zero, um, because you can't raise zero to a power of just b zero. But what a to the power of b times a to the power of c equals a to the power of the quantity b plus c. Um, so this is just basically, uh, for example, if we let a equals three and then b equals two and c equals one, that would just be the same as writing three, three times. So it's just a to the power of b plus c. Um, our second rule is a to the power of b divided by a to the power of c, um, which equals a to the power of the quantity b minus c. Um, this is just basically the reverse of the, um, the previous rule, uh, basically, when you're dividing, you're just subtracting the exponents. Um, our third rule um, 
is when we have a to the power of c times b to the power of c. Um, it equals a times b to the power of c. Oops. Okay. Uh, number four, a to the power of b, like in parentheses, to the power of c equals a to the power of b times c because we're basically raising an exponent to an exponent. So we multiply the exponents together. Um, eight, uh, and our fifth rule is a to the power of a fraction b over c is equal to a to the power of b. Um, and then we have the, we have like a square root with the c sign, which basically means like one over c. Um, and then our last rule is a to the power of negative b, which equals to one over the quantity a to the power of b. Um, that's also very important to know. Okay. Our seventh rule is that anything to the power of zero always equals one. Um, there's no proof for that. I can explain, but that you should know that because anything to the power of zero equals one. All right, so our first example is when we have five to the power of x squared minus seven x, which equals to 25 to the power of uh, 25 to the fifth power. So, lost some text here. So the first thing that we want to do here is, um, there isn't latex for this, so I can't. But so this is just the same thing on the left side equals. We want to switch the right side into um, the same base, so we can write this as five to the power of power of ten. All right. Uh, this makes sense because um, five squared equals twenty-five, and then we're raising that to the fifth power, so it's five to the power of two times five, which is ten. And then, since the bases are even, we want the um, exponents to be equal equal as well. So we get seven x squared minus seven x. And then we can subtract ten from both sides, and we are left with a quadratic formula that, or not quadratic, one, or um, left with a quadratic that. Uh, we can solve easily by factoring. Factoring this, we can do equals zero. So our answer is x equals five. Uh, x equals two. However, uh, there are times when like uh, you can find extraneous solutions. So um, it's it's important to uh, realize this. So. If we plug five back in, we get 25 minus 35. So that would be uh, five to the power of negative 10. And uh, that, that actually would not be the same, but x equal two does work. So, so I think, I believe x equals two should be uh, the only answer. Give me a moment. Yeah, I'm still okay. Let me get off. All right, so this is just an overview of what we just did. We changed 25 to the fifth to 5 to the 10th, and then we rewrote the equation. Then we got a quadratic, and then uh, we got uh, x equals 2, comma 5. And then there's actually a mistake here. Like you have to plug that back into here and then uh, check for extra tenuous uh, solutions. Um, so then uh, our answer would be actually just uh, x equals two. All right, so we move on to our second example. Um, basically, we have to find all values of n such that six to the power of two times quantity six to the power of n to the power of n equals Six to the power of n times six to the power of n times six to the power of n. All right, so we can first simplify the right side. So 
Um, if we multiply 6 to n three times, then we get 6 to the power of 3n. And then we simplify the right side and we get 6 to the power of n squared plus 2. And then we can get rid of the bases because they're the same. And then we get, we're left with another quadratic that um, we can solve. So then our answer should be n equals 1 or n equals 2. Um, and then we should always go back and see if this works. We plug it back in. So we got n equals 1 and n equals 2. So if we plug in 1, then we get 6 to the power of 2 times 6 to the power of 1 to the power of 1. So that, that's just 6 to the power of 3. And then so n equals 1 works. And then if we plug in 2, 2 is a little harder. So I can write 2 times power of 2 equals I can make it, I'm trying to make this water. And this is just 6 to the power of 6, which is, so um, we are left with the expression that's true. So n equals 1 and n equals 2 works. All right, we, we go on to our final ex uh, third example. So we have 9 to the power of x minus 1, which equals y. And then we have to find 3 to the power of 2x plus 3. So um, we, we only know that 9 to the power of x minus 1 equals y. So we probably want to uh, manipulate that into something that's 3 to the power of something and then try to find uh, 3 to the power of 2x plus 3. So um, yeah, answer will include y, and our desired term is base of 3. So we definitely change the base into 3 because that's the format that uh, the question is asking for. So 9 to the power of x minus 1. So 9 is equal to 3 squared. So then um, 9 to the power of x minus 1 would equal 3 to the power of 2 parentheses x minus 1, which equals 3 to the power of 2x minus 2, which equals y. So now that we've gotten it down to something with the base of 3, um, we realize that 3 to the power of 2x minus 2 and 3 to the power of 2x plus 3 have a difference of 5. So we would have to multiply by 3 to the power of 5 to get 3 to the power of 2x plus 3. And 3 to the 5 is just 243. So our answer is 243y. That's, um, if you guys have any questions, please put them in the chat or to one of the TAs. All right, number four, we're, we're moving on to some hard stuff here. We have an Amy problem number one, or Amy one problem eight. So uh, the equation to the power of 333x minus two plus two to the power of 111x plus two equals two to the power of the quantity 222x plus one, and then plus one has three real roots. And then we have to find their sum. So just a heads up that this problem is very difficult to the one shown above and it requires more ingenious manipulations. Um, that's actually true with many Amy problems. So, all right, so first we change the solution to um, with our exponent rules. So you might be wondering what, where we got the one fourth and four and two and one. So if we go back here, we see that it's two to the power of 333 X minus two. So we can break them up. So it's 2 to the power of negative 2 times 2 to the power of 333x. So that's how we get 1 fourth. And then we can do the same for every single number, which is how we get basically 2 to the power of negative 2, which is 1 fourth, times 2 to the power of 333x, dot, 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 all the way down for the entire equation. So <clears throat> uh, right here, we see that there's a lot of 2 to the power of 111. So we create a variable, so it simplifies things for us. And then if we substitute it, we get 1 fourth y cubed plus 4y equals 2y squared plus 1. Also, I realized there is a typo here. This should be 2 times 2 to the power of 222x. So. 
but this is the fraction you should have gotten even without typo. So if we clear the denominator and multiply by four on both sides, we get y cubed plus 16y equals 8y squared plus four. And then we move everything to one side and now we have a cubic. So now we're looking for the sum of the three real roots. However, in this equation, uh, we're solving for y. So um, if you do not know Vieta's formula, we're, we're going to be using that briefly. In this. Basically, Vieta's formula is like, uh, in this particular scenario, um, if y1, y2, and y3 are the roots, then the sum of um, the roots would be 8. And then uh, y1 times y2 plus y1 times one, y3 plus y2 times y3 equals negative 16. And then the product of these three roots would be 4. And you can all get this from Vieta's formulas, which is um, you can check out. And now since y1, y2, and y3 each correspond to a solution of x, we can set y1 back to equal the 2 to the power of 111 x1, y2 equals 2 to the power of 111 x2, and then so on. So we substitute these back into the equations. So this was exactly the same as our Vieta's formulas as before. It just looks so much bigger now because we plugged in bigger, big numbers for y, but it's, it's just the same thing. And we see something similar in the sum of x1, x2, and x3 in the third equation. So we see that uh, the exponents equal to 111x1 plus 111x2 plus 111x3 equals 4. So then since 4 is just 2 squared, we can uh, get rid of the base and look at only the exponents, which is how we get 111 x1 plus x2 plus x3, which equals 2. So then uh, solving our equation, the sum of the roots will be 2 over 111. So I do realize that you might not understand how we got this. So basically, if we go back here. If we plug uh, all three of these, 2 to the power of 111 x1, and then put them in for these three, uh, we can use our exponent rule that if we multiply exponents with the same base that we can add their exponents. Basically, when we multiply all three of these together, we can add them right here, which is how, what we use. And then we ended up solving the um, answer. So some things you should be careful of is like how we got rid of base numbers in the above problem. So yes, this, is, this works, but it only works sometimes. We have to still be aware of the base of our exponent because especially if the base is equal to one, uh, which means that one to the power of f of x, which is some function f. Um, we can apply the same idea of getting rid of these base numbers. Um, because one to the power of anything is just one. And the same thing is base is equal to negative one. Um, we can apply the same idea of getting rid of base numbers because a negative one to the power of f of x will equal one if f of x is just even or divisible by two, as it says here. And then <clears throat> we can use this to get that like negative one to the power of f of x equals negative one to the power of g of x. Only if f of x and g of x uh, differ by an even number, which would show that either they're both equal to one or they're both equal to negative one. It, it's just something you should be careful of and you can um, know about them uh, if you ever encounter them. So, so some, some summary about exponent problems. You should try to uh, change into the same base. So then you can take the constants down from the exponent. And then you remember the end goal so you don't sidetrack like that problem with 9 to the power of x minus 1 equals y. And then we have to get an answer in terms of y. It's important that you realize like what our end goal or what our end answer is supposed to be. It's like in the AOPS books, if you read them, it's like keep your eye on the ball. All right. So these are some exercises. 
Um, yeah. uh, these are some exercises that the students can work on uh, for a break. Um, you guys would like to work on them. Um, uh, I'll give you some time right now. Also, like after you get an answer, you can GM a TA with the answer, and then they can help you walk you through it. And um, I might uh, show how to solve some of these. Okay, um, I'll continue speaking in like maybe three to four minutes. If you want to confirm any of your answers, you can always um, DM one of us.
Okay. Um, I'm gonna move on just for now. Um, if you guys want to come back to these, um, I'm sure that these slides will be posted. Okay. But let us move on to our next topic, which is logarithms. So logarithms is basically the reverse of exponents. So <clears throat> log a of b equals x is exactly the same as saying a to the power of x equals b. And <clears throat> as before, a is the base. And verbally read, it says the log of a of b is x, which you can see right over here. Um, for a, a logarithm to be defined, a is greater than b and b is greater than zero and a cannot be equal to one. So just a quick remark that logarithmic form and exponential form are often interchangeable and they're both very useful in solving problems. And you'll actually see them like almost every year. You'll see at least um, what one logarithm problem on the Amy, which is kind of nice to know. So some logarithmic properties. So the log of a of b plus the log of a of c equals the log of a times b c. So and then the log of a of b minus the log of a of c equals the log of a of b over c. So if, if we're adding logarithms of the same base, um, with the same base, if you add them, then it's the same as uh, multiplying them uh, with under the same base. And then log of a of b, if we're subtracting uh, logs with the same base, then that's the same as divide, having them um, just dividing them by uh, whatever number that the base is like, being like, outputting. <laughs> Um, so the log of a to the power of m uh, of b to the power of n equals n over m times the log of a of b. <clears throat> and the log of a of b equals, um, this is quite important actually, the log of c of b and the log of c of a. <clears throat> and off of that, we know that log of a of b times the log of b of c equals the log of a of c. Um, this is kind of like known as change of base. Or like how we know that log of a of b equals log of b over log of a, which is usually very helpful. <clears throat> so proving the properties, uh, log of a of b plus the log of a of c equals a log A of B, C. So this was our first property. So if we assign variables to them, like log of A of B equals X and log of A of C equals Y, we can utilize exponential form. And basically this becomes exponents. So H to the power of X equals B and log A um, of the C equals Y. So if we're adding X plus Y, X plus Y equals log of A, of a to the power of x plus y. And that's just b times c. So we can substitute this into the following equation. And, uh, the right-hand side and the left-hand side will be x plus y. So um, our proof is complete. Um, for property number two, this is essentially the exact same proof. Uh, we're going to be plugging in variables. However, this time it's x minus y. Um, so since h to the power of x equals b and h to the power of y equals c, if we plug them in, b over c equals h to the power of x over h to the power of y. So that would just be h to the power of x minus y. And both sides do x, um, become x minus y. So this is true from definition of logarithm. So proof is complete. Um, for property number three, log a of m, uh, b of n equals n over m times log of a of b. So we create and assign a variable. So log of a of m, b 
of n equals x. We can change this into exponential form. And we want log of a of b. So we change the exponential expression to a over m of n of x equals b. And we do this by taking the nth root of both sides. And then we take the logarithm of both sides. So we're left with m of, over n of x equals log a of b. And then we can multiply both sides by n over m, and then our proof is complete. <laughs> All right, property number four, we have log a of b. And then we have log of c of b over log c of a. So we, we keep on assigning variables to these numbers. And this is because it's very easy to switch logarithms into exponents. So our first equation becomes log of a of b equals x over y. And then converting into exponential form, we know that c up to the power of x equals b and c to the power of y equals a. So then c to equals a to the power of one over y. <clears throat> and we know that because we take the, um, the yth root of both sides of uh, the second, c to the power of y equals a, and we multiply by c to the power, of, or we take the by the root of both sides. And then c to the power of x equals c to, uh, equals a to the power of x over y, which equals b. And then we take the logarithm of both sides. From this, we get log a of b equals x over y, um, because we take the log of this, and then we take the log of this from over my cursor width. So um, we're done. Um, now we move on to number five, which this is a very important change of base. So log A of B times log B of C equals log A of C. Now this is extremely important um, because we convert the left-hand side to some base D. So log D of B over log D of A times log D of C, log D of B. So we perform the calculations and <clears throat> we get we realize we can get rid of the numerator of log b of um, log a of b and then the denominator of log b of c. So then we're left with over log d of a. And from change of base, we know that this is log of a of c. Now we we didn't go into log of base specifically, so Basically, it states that log of a of b equals, I don't get this, log underscore. Sorry, I'm not getting it. Log a of b equals. This is really important to know. This is like how you can get rid of logarithms very easily, and you can also like manipulate them as fractions. So that's extremely important to know. So now we move on to some examples. So basically, we have this expression with a base, and then the exponent has a log in it. So you can simplify this problem by combining terms with the same exponent properties, or combining terms with the same base using exponent properties. So we group the bases with fives together, and then we group the ones with twos together. 
then we can add add the exponents. So we get five to the power of log of 10 of two plus log 10 of nine times two to the power of log 10 of three plus log 10 of six. And then since log a of b plus log a of c equals log a of b times c, it implies that five log 10 of 18 times two log 10 of 18 is our current expression. So we realize that these terms have the same exponent. So we can combine the bases and multiply them. This becomes 10 log 10 to the power of 18. And we can simplify this and our answer will be 18. However, it's also important to realize why this is true. So if we let log 10 of 18 equal x, which is basically the exponent, exponent over here, we know that 10 to the power of x equals 18 because that's the definition of this uh, logarithm right here. However, we also realize that our, this question is asking for 10 to the power of x, which we have right here. So thus our answer is 18. Also, I know that this is over some text, so it might not look the best. Hopefully that made sense. Now we have an Amy problem. So, we're supposed to determine the value of AB if log 8 of A plus log 4 of B squared equals 5 and log 8 of B plus log 4 A squared equals 7. So we can change our equation. Uh, so it's 1 third times log 2 of A plus log 2 of B equals 5 and log 2 of A plus 1 third times log 2 of B equals seven. Look back and we got this because log of eight can also be written as two to the power of three. And one of our logarithmic rules stated that um, we can bring, if it's power of eight to the power of eight to the power of b, we can take that b out. So it becomes one over b, which is what we did here. And here we can uh, take actually log four of b squared. Four is actually equal to two squared. So then we can simplify this into log two of b. So we now have two equations that have very similar logarithmic and actually exactly the same uh, logarithms. So we realize that working the same base is much easier. So um, when we're dealing with fractions, we can bring in the one third. So we make the cube root over A and a cube root over B. And then <clears throat> the cube roots seem a little messy. And if we add the equations before we brought one third in, then we'll, we will have the same coefficients. So <clears throat> if we add these equations, we get four over three times log two of A plus log two of B equals 12. So clearing the fraction, we have log two of A, a times B equals nine. We got this because log two of A plus log two of B equals log two of A times B. So thus, <clears throat> AB equals two to the power of nine, which is just 512. Hmm. And note that this problem went through a variety of different logarithmic rules and properties. And many of the time we use exponents, which logarithms um, correspond with greatly. So we have another example, which is uh, find the value of log or the square root of the quantity log two of six plus log three of six. So we can try to change the base to six so we create terms um, that we can work with. So now we get one plus log two of three plus one plus log three of two. Now you're, you might be asking how we got this. So well, let's go back to the previous slide. So 
So log two of six equals log two of two plus log I want to draw there. I'll, I'll try to draw actually. So log two of six equals log of but yeah, my handwriting is terrible. We're not doing this. <clears throat> We're going back to text. Basically, what I was trying to say is log of 2 of 6 equals 2 of 2 plus log 2 of 3. So this is true because we know that log with the same base, which is 2, if we add them, we can multiply them. And 2 times 3, so 2 times 3 is 6. And this equals 1 plus log of 2 of 3. And we do the same for the second logarithm as well. So <clears throat> that's how we get square root of 2 plus log 2 of 3 plus log 3 of 2. Now we try to create and assign a variable. So we let x equal log 2 of 3. And since log 2 of 3 and log 3 of 2 are reciprocals of each other, and we know this because change of base, since log 2 of 3 is equal to log of 3 over log of 2, and log 3 of 2 is log of 2 over log of 3. So you just switch the numerator and denominator. We get 2 plus x plus 1 over x. And through some algebraic manipulation, we see that the term inside of the square root can actually be expressed as square root of x plus 1 over square root of x squared. So thus, since the square and the square root cancel out, we're left with square root of x plus 1 over square root of x. And as we substitute log 2 of 3 back in as x, we get the answer log 2 of 3 plus log 3 of 2, um, which is our final answer. Now we have an Amy problem, which is even more scary. And it has some notation that we haven't seen before, which is ceiling and floors. So basically, before I start the problem, a ceiling is when you have a number, any number, and if you have a ceiling, you round up to the nearest integer. And you always round up no matter what. So the numbers that uh, basically you would round up to would be maybe 14.01 on the ceiling would be equal to 15. And maybe 14.99. Or this would be equal to 14. So it doesn't matter, like, even if it's super close to 15, 14.99999999, we'll still, if it's the ceiling, it'll be equal to 14. So anyways, continue with the problem. So we have, oh, we also have summation notation, which if you guys don't know, basically we're gonna psych, we're gonna sum it all where k equals one and then k equals two, two k equals three, all the way until k equals 1,000. So we have this really brutal, complicated equation. So we have to find the remainder when n is divided by 1,000. And it gives you some definitions of what a floor and ceiling are, but I just showed you. <clears throat> so this, yeah, as I said before, this expression looks very um, grotesque. However, it's actually very simple. We realize there's a ceiling minus a floor inside of the summation. So if we ignore the summation, look at the terms inside. Yeah. K parentheses, <clears throat> ceiling log of square root of two K ceiling 
minus the floor of log square root of 2 of k. <clears throat> so if log of square root of 2 of k is not an integer, then the expression inside of parentheses equals 1. Now, this is not actually, this at first is not intuition. Uh, this, you, you can't realize this at first. Log, and I do this underscore if you guys didn't know. Square root of two. This is the log square root of two and a space of, let's just say two minus, and we have to take the ceiling, of course. I can't do it, but I'll just do a ceiling here. Make this wider. And then the floor of the log. So basically, this is what we have. So basically, inside of the ceiling, we have log of square root of 2 of 2. And that's just equal to 4, because square root of 2 squared would be equal to 2. And then we square that again, so that would be 4. And then this bottom is the exact same, so it's just 4. So these numbers will be the same if log of square root of 2 of k is an integer. However, many of the times it isn't. And so basically, if it's not um, an integer, then uh, we're going to get a discrepancy. Because if we have the number 14.01, And let's just say that's what this equals to, like log two square root of two of k to 41. Then we're gonna, like the ceiling is gonna equal to 15 and the floor is gonna equal to 14. So basically if we subtract them, like 15 minus 14, that equals to one. So we realize that if it's not an integer, then it's always gonna be one. So our inside term just simplifies into k because it's always either equal, always equal to zero or it's equal to one. So for log square root of two of k to be an integer, k has to be a power of square root of two. However, we can make it e even easier. It can only be a power of two because um, all of the numbers that we're putting in for k is going to be an integer. So Square root of two is not an integer, but two is. And all the powers of square root of two will be a power of two, or like some of them, all of them that are integers at least. So our expression will equal to zero because the left term equals the right term. So basically, we just have to solve this. The summation of k equals one of two 1,000 equals k. However, we have to come back and subtract the ones that are powers of two, obviously, but for right now, we can just solve this expression here, which, which we can use by plugging in this equation. But it's important to realize that this is equal to one plus two plus three plus four plus dot dot dot. So that's what it's equal to all the way to 1,000. And then we can use the sum of like consecutive integers from, starting from one. So that's 500,500. However, we have to subtract powers of two and we sum all of the powers of two less than a thousand. Basically, what we did here was um, the finite geometric sequence, it's A plus AR plus AR squared plus AR cubed. So all the way to AR to the power of N equals um, AR to the power of N plus one minus one over R minus one, but we'll talk about more about that in depth. So this is, uh, we get some of the parts two is 1,023. 
And then we subtract that. So we get our answer is 499477, but we need to take mod 1000. And this is be only because the Amy accepts answers from zero to 999. So our answer would just be the last three digits, which is 477. So that actually wasn't a hard problem. Um, and most of the times we can just combine terms and working with the same base and coefficients are much easier. And you should be aware that end goal, this is always always true, you should always keep your eye on the problem. And uh, one of my own things is that a logarithm um, is very similar to exponents. Like if you know your exponents, you know your logarithms. And if you know your logarithms, you know your exponents. And I think that this is important, like, uh, for you to know because you can always change from one to the other and that makes your life easier. So these are some exercises. All right. So these are all like Amy or Alcos problems. So these are pretty hard. Um, I'll give you uh, some time to uh, solve these problems. Again, you can DM either of us uh, if you want to confirm any of the answers.
All right, um, we'll be starting again in approximately maybe one, two minutes. All right. All right, let's start into our last topic today, which is introduction to radicals. Okay, a radical is basically an expression which uses a root, and that root can be a square root, a cube root, or any root until the nth root. So for example, you can see the cube root of 64, um, some random notation. The thing that we always see like um, check mark notation is called radicals. Uh, the number three is called the index. 64 is called the radicand and the entire expression itself is called the radical. Now, here we have some basic radical rules. Now, most of these rules are pretty intuitive but it's still too good to understand all of them. So we have X to the power or um, square root of n is equal to x to the power of 1 over n. Our second rule is that, that we have the nth root of x times the nth root of y. Um, that's equivalent to the nth root time, times the quantity x times y. Then if we have a fraction inst inside of, um, of the radicand, we have we can split that into the numerator and the denominator. And we have the nth root of x over the nth root of y. So basically we split the fraction. Then our fourth radical rule is that the nth root of x to the power of m equals x to the power of m over n. And basically this is, number four is just um, an extension of our rule number one because we have x to the power of m and then we multiply that by one over n, so we get x to the power of m over n. Okay, some things you cannot do. Uh, you, if you have a summation inside of the square root expression thing, uh, you can't like split those, those have to stay inside. So a key concept with radicals is when you have to rationalize the denominator. So basically, uh, we can look at this term, one over the quantity square root of three minus the square root of two. And basically, we want to rationalize the denominator, so we multiply the top and bottom by its radical conjugate. Now, the radical conjugate of radical is usually when we multiply by, um, we have like a plus square root of b, we multiply by a minus square root of b, um, just so that we can get rid of all radical expressions in the denominator. So for the example, the radical conjugate for an expression square root of a plus the square root of b is the square root of a minus the square root of b. So we multiply by square root of a minus square root of b on the top and the bottom. And when we multiply them, um, it results in difference of squares. So we result with a minus b, which will definitely be an integer because a and b are both integers. So going back to our original example, we multiply the top and bottom. So our numerator becomes square root of three plus square root of two 
and then the bottom just becomes one because it becomes three minus two, which is just one. So our final answer is one over the square root of three minus square root of two is equivalent to square root of three plus square root of two. So we don't like our denominators being rational partly because it's extremely difficult to estimate the value of an, a term like that. And in order to do this, we need to get rid of the square root in the denominator. So apart from uh, rationalizing, sometimes we have nesting, um, which is uh, a common concept that you see when we have a square root inside of another square root. So one of our examples here is we have to simplify the expression, the square root of six plus two square root of five. So we first try to get the square root. So we try to make a larger square root for the perfect square. And we do this because our result would be if we have the square root of a squared, this equals to the absolute value of a or in just positive a. So we set up the equation the square root of six plus two square root of five equals a plus b square root of five. And we use this square root of five here, um, right here, because uh, we see that in this expression it has a square root of five. And if we expand it out, um, we want to have a square root of five in our expression after we expand it. So if we square both sides, now we just have to deal with some algebra here. We get six plus two plus uh, square root of five equals a squared plus five b squared plus two ab square root of five. So after we equate irrational and rational terms, we get two equations. We get two ab equals two. This is because uh, we know that there's a square root five after the two AB and there's a square root five here. And none of the other terms can have a square root of five after. So then our other equation becomes A squared plus five B squared equals six. So AB equals one. So we try A equals one and B equals one and they both work. And you can also just do A equals one over B and then plug that into the second equation. And plugging it back in, we can see that it works. Um, sometimes uh, we can clear out double roots primarily through an educated guess, but the process can get very bashy and it can greatly simplify our problem. Oh, now we have to rationalize the denominator for a little bit of a different type and it's a little harder. So we can't use previous methods here. However, we can use the difference of cubes formula. So we recall that for factorization, a cubed minus b cubed equals a minus b times a squared plus ab plus b squared. So we plug that in here. We let a equals the cube root of seven and b equals one. Now we multiply the top and bottom of the fraction by plugging the second part, a squared plus ab plus b squared. And then the bottom just become a difference of cubes, so we get six. And then the top is what well, we have, a squared plus ab plus b squared. So this is our final answer. The cube root of 49 plus the cube root of seven plus one, all over six. Now <clears throat> we have our another example, which is even more ugly. So with radicals, you can get quite ugly. And I'm telling you now, it can get very ugly. All right. so. For the second term, we can use our trick of simplifying the square root. So second term, he means this one over here after the minus sign. And we easily get that it's square root of two minus one. I won't be going into depth on how you do this because it's, we already did it in a previous example. Um, however, for the first term, we need to approach it differently because it's in a different like setup. So squaring the fraction will get rid of a lot of radicals. So if we let the entire expression equal to A and we square everything, after we go through a bunch of geometry um, and like simplifying everything, we see that A squared equals two plus two square root of five 
all over square root of five plus one. And we probably want to rationalize this. And this is obviously too obvious. Okay, you don't need to rationalize because you can multiply the denominator by two, which means that a squared equals to two. But we know that a equals square root of two now. So going back to our original equation, we have square root of two minus the square root of two minus one. So our answer is just one. So yes, I know that this was, so basically this is another way you can just write one. <clears throat> now we have a, another Amy problem, or not another, we have an Amy problem here. So we have a bunch of pretty nasty looking expressions on the denominator here. And we want to find an answer in terms of x plus one to the power of 48. So the square roots with the large numbers seem terrifying, but we observe that the degree of the roots is all powers of two. And it reminds us of this factorization, a to the power of n minus one equals we can take a minus one out and it becomes a to the power of n minus one plus a to the power of n minus two plus a to the power of n minus three dot 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 all the way to a plus one. Now the denominator of x has a great resemblance of this factorization. So we will have a equal to uh, the 16th root of five. So the term will become four times the square uh, 16th root of five minus one all over four. And then if we divide by four, uh, we get that that 16th root of five minus one equals x. So if we have the 16th root of five minus one plus one to the power of 48, uh, we just have the 16th root of five, which um, to the power of 48, and that's just five cubed, which equals to 125. Now, it's basically we know this because if we let a equal five, it would become a plus one. And then the rest of the expressions, if we um, expand it, uh, if we let a equals the fifth root of 16 or 16th root of five, 16th root of five minus one equals, um, 16th root of five minus one times blah, 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 all the way down. And if we multiply the top and the bottom by 16th root of five minus one, the term will become four times the 16th root of five minus one all over four, which equals the 16th root of five minus one. So yeah, um, there's not one trick pony when solving these radical problems. There are many general concepts that we can use and to manipulate the equ equations to get what we want to achieve. So when rationalizing, try to remember factorization and you don't want to mind simplify. There's always uh, a nice way. Simplifying is good, but sometimes if you oversimplify, you, you get into some simplifying that you didn't need to do. Sometimes creating polynomials can help solve ugly terms, like changing some ugly radical into a variable that is much easier to read. And the fewer radicals there are, the easier to it is to solve the problem. Now, here are some exercises for the radicals. All right. I'll give you guys approximately maybe 10 minutes to do this. So yeah, good luck. Again, if you want to confirm any answer, you can DM me. Okay. So maybe I'm not.
Uh, so it's uh, four twenty-five p.m. my time, or five twenty-five, or well now it's five twenty-six p.m. in EST time. Uh, sorry for any background noise. Uh, so we have I guess five minutes till we end. So now we're just gonna go over uh some like last few notes. Uh, so first off, uh, I was recording the whole time. I'm still recording. I'll end the recording at the end of my talking or the end of this class. Um, and hopefully this does upload to YouTube. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I will have an issue and I'll have to resolve that. But hopefully like we're, we want it so that it's on YouTube so you can just go to the link. But if not, we can just like share like a Google Drive file of it till we fix that. So yeah, and also the handout will be posted um shortly after uh this last session so hopefully later today uh it's basically where the we adapted from but you know there's more problems in there there's also a problem set that you can you know solve which is you know solve afterwards and yeah that's basically it uh, if you want answers to the exercises you can just uh say in like the discord server afterwards and then you know We'll, we'll pull that up for you because, you know, we didn't have much time to, you know, for you guys to go over all the exercises. So maybe if you wanted to solve them after. And yeah, that's basically it. Uh, thank you for attending. And thank you to everyone from the AOP staff who helped out. And when, you know, this includes from you know, Ephraim, who's teaching, uh, Vikram, Vivian, who are TAing, and you know, whoever created the material, which is specifically Vincent Chang. You'll see his name on the handout. And yeah, that's basically it. I'm stopping the recording.